So of course, uh, a reminder that uh, the conference is brought to you by our transcription partner, Cortico. Uh, Cortico uses their Fora app to facilitate small group conversations based on lived experiences. Fora combines AI and human listening, helping organizations understand and utilize discussions for public dialogue and decision-making, offering authenticity, nuance, and transparency beyond what typical surveys and fo focus groups can provide. The Minor Collective, again, shout out to the Thought Sanctuary. We've got the last one here tonight, uh, which I think will be a great capstone to this experience. It's a community movement to reimagine school, and that Thought Sanctuary is a curated space for educators to joyfully and safely generate practical dream-based ideas. Participants can connect, share ideas, stay curious, and have fun. This gathering helps apply learning from keynotes, conversations, and workshops to everyday classroom life. And we'll be back on that Zoom tonight from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. And lastly, Stimpunks, shout out to Ryan Boren, who's in the room with us here. Love it. Stimpunks, close collaborator with HRP, uh, uh, great partnership, great friendship here is dedicated to creating an inclusive world for neurodivergent and disabled individuals. They challenge traditional systems, advocate for accessibility, and promote a supportive community. Their innovative, innovative approach combines direct support, advocacy, and education, driving change in public perception and policy. And lastly, it's my pleasure, my privilege to introduce the Orchard View Innovative Learning Center, a Muskegon, Michigan, 16 plus adult education and high school completion center focused on learning by doing self-directed education, empowering all learners, some of whom are in the space with uh, Teresa in her, her blacked out Zoom box here, um, and, and making community connections. Those classes are free to the public and aim to improve adult learners' education levels while enhancing access to employment, job training, and post-secondary education opportunities. So uh, I'll introduce, gosh, let's see, who all do we have from the crew here? Nick, do you want to, I'll pass the mic to you and you can um, shout out the people who are joining you from the ILC. Hey, you got it. Um... I got to look at the screen here. So underneath me on my screen, I've got Chandler Tuttle. Chandler worked with us last year as a math teacher. Um, because of her young roots, she's spreading her wings and going to Philadelphia where she can find other young people to hang out with. Because anybody that's been to Muskegon knows that Muskegon is not a, uh, a hotbed for those looking to spread their wings and find the good social stuff. So Chandler's with us. I've got uh, Teresa Tate. Teresa is an ELA teacher with us. Uh, loves to dabble into the humanities. Um, she, in her room, has a plethora of students, including Demarcus, who is a big part of our keynote. Faith is down there. I seen Lindsay down there. I seen Caitlin down there. So there's a there they all are. There's a handful of um, righteous students who are willing to push the boundaries and ask the right kind of questions. I've also got Andrew Loss on. He's our social studies teacher. Um, he too has been with us all week here on this platform, learning from all of you and growing his skills. And last but not least, in the background of Teresa's screen, there is um, Amanda Campbell, not Camp Bell. Uh, Amanda is our science teacher, and she is about as bold as they come when it comes to pushing the boundaries of what education could look like in the world of science. So I think that's all we have. And um, Nick, back to you. Oh, that's great. I'll, as I wait for our eager participants to uh, raise hands, drop uh, questions in chat, I do have a real quick, this is kind of a lightning round question that I was thinking of as I was rewatching the keynote this morning. Um, and it's going to require everyone uh, at some point to unmute. Um, so, and, and I don't care who starts this, but I just want to know if you could describe your experience, your ILC experience in one word, what word would you use to describe it? And someone's got to go first. That's too rude. We'll, uh, we'll start in my room. Woo. Um, mine would be authentic. Marcus, what's yours? <laughs> right, you're doing your, you're doing your too much pressure. Answer. Exciting. Come back to you. Well, that's one. Um, I'd say diverse. Diverse from Faith. I would say a little, for me, challenging. I guess. 
challenging for Kaylin. I know this is not one word, but two words be life-changing. Life-changing from DeMarcus. I was also going to use life-changing. I'll change to invigorating. <laughs> I'll oh, cheat. Oh, it's just like, I guess. I'll cheat and hyphen it. Sorry for talking over each other. Um, I'll cheat and hyphenate and say that it was eye opening. Mine is humbling, guys. Did we get everybody? I think so. I think so, we did. I, I took I took notes on this over here. So just look at that list, right? Authentic, exciting, diverse, challenging. A couple of votes for life changing, invigorating, eye opening, humbling. These these are not the typical words uh, when you ask uh, students in particular, but even staff to describe their experience um, with school. Uh, so so my follow up that I had not planned to follow up with this, but I'm I'm kind of wondering, and then I'll target this at Nick in particular, uh, but like. Why are you the way that you are? What? Why do you think so differently about this? And and of course, this goes to the staff um, and uh, everything else. Like, is there an experience or a person or an interaction that like caused you to think and create a a place where you can describe it in in such a way? Um. Nick, that's a really tough question, and it's bringing in a little bit of a disemotion side of me. Um, I spent a good number of years as an assistant principal in a traditional um, fifth and sixth grade building, and I remember spending a ton of time with, I'm going to use the words, those kids. And now I say it's these kids, these guys in my background here, these guys that, that make this school a school. And I remember not feeling good and going home and going, what I did today wasn't, it wasn't okay. You know, I followed the traditional pattern of, do what you're supposed to do, walk in the hallways. The keynote yesterday kept punching me in the face, like, oh my gosh, I did that one. Oh, I did that one. I made control, but I didn't make safety. Um, so I walked away from that and I had an opportunity to go explore project-based learning with our ISD as a, a coach for across the county. And I really got to dabble into this idea of authenticity and looking at humans and not necessarily just students. And um, I got hungry for leadership again through that process. So assistant principal, coach around project-based learning, hungry for this idea of leadership. And um, Simeon isn't on today, but Simeon Frank and my boss, Brandy Carey, they convinced me to interview for the, pro for the job. And um, I just went all in. I went, you know, who cares? <laughs> you guys, I love you down here in Teresa's class. But quite frankly, most of the parents at the point when they come to us, they don't they don't care. They just want them to be nice and sweet and go to school and not get phone calls. And I'm going, no, come here, be naughty, and let's figure out what we have to do differently to make this work for you. And that's a really long answer to that, but um, it was a passion for those kids. And I'll leave it there. I'll let anybody else go. Brilliant, Nick. Yeah, and... Anybody else on the ILC team, feel free just to speak to that. I guess I'll put my two cents in. Um, so the ILC is actually my first job out of college ever. And I did not know what to expect coming in because when I, you probably heard this when I, you saw me on the video, but uh I had this really outdated notion of what alternative education was and kind of is in other places. But um, when I got to actually talk and meet with those kids, my kids, our kids, um, I just felt like this is the place I need to be. I need to help these, these particular students who may have not gotten the greatest education where they were and I wanted to be that step above for them. I don't know if I'm rambling or making sense, but that's what I'm feeling. My um, philosophy has always been, or at least throughout my, so I've taught for six years and as I've gone through those six years, my philosophy has more and more boiled down to 
being the adult that I needed when I was a teenager. Um, and that, like, I wasn't the, the typical kid that you see in, like, alternative ed spaces. Um, I had, you know, high grades and school was easy and I didn't break any rules and all of that. But there was a lot going on underneath that I needed support with. And I didn't realize then that I needed support with it, but um, there's a lot that would have been different if I'd had it. And so being the adult that I needed when I was a teen, that's really, that's really kind of my, like, why are you like this answer, I guess. So awesome. Anyone else from the ILC team want to speak to that? I guess I'll go. Uh, this is Amanda and I guess I'm like this just because I've always been like this. I I feel like I treat everybody the way I would want to be treated. So I love joking around. I love being sarcastic. And that's just what comes out. And I do like pushing the boundaries, like Nick said. Uh, remember, like when this whole program started, it was nothing like what it was before when I worked here. And I know, I think the turning point when I really realized that was when we were clearing out some brush to make a garden and this one kid wanted to use a chainsaw and he's like 16, 17. I was like, I don't know about that. Let me go ask Nick. And Nick was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And I was like, what the hell? Okay. <laughs> so, and it was, he did great and it was scary and it was fun. And it was like, this is the stuff that I can now do. And we are able to allow our students to shine with the things that they already have and not just be like, no, you can't do that. You can't do that kind of stuff in school. And it's just, it's an awakening and it's fun. So, yeah. That's awesome. If there's not anybody else who wants to comment on that, I will gladly pass the mic to Mason. Uh, probably not for the last time either. Thanks, Mason. So I kind of had a, a twofold question, one for the, the staff and one for the students. Um, for the staff, I was wondering what in your mind makes a good PBL project? Because this year I tried to do that in my classroom and out of like the six and a half units I taught, I think I maybe did like one good PBL project. So from a, a staff perspective, how do you design a good PBL project? And from a student perspective, what things have your favorite PBL projects included? What have what have, has made those like engaging or fun for you? So first, Mason, um, well done for like diving into this stuff because PBL is really freaking hard. Like it's a lot. Um, I've been trying bits and pieces of it since my first year teaching and it took several years for me to get a good project off the ground and do it. And I still half the time, like it doesn't, the end product is not what I envisioned at the beginning. Um, and I think that flexibility and being okay with that is part of it. I think that is part of creating a good project and, and changing things as you see what's working and what's not. Um, beyond that, I think getting student input has been a game changer for a lot of my projects and like starting like the the dreaming idea sessions with a like a focus group of of like four or five students like what do you guys think about this project what do you guys think like what what questions do you have what do you like about it what would you change about it um that student voice piece is huge Well, I'm a I'm a student, not uh, not a teacher. But yeah, so this is Lindsay. Um, basically, like I would say that along with what you just said, getting students more into it. Like if you just set something in front of a student, of course it's going to be just like any other assignment. You know, they're going to think of it as work that was just put in front of them. They're not going to want to get into it. It's going to be like, oh, I just got handed another packet that I have to do. Like. In math class, we did kites, and that was how we learned about angles and stuff like that. We did golf courses. We learned that was interactive. We got to cut with a saw. We had to nail things together. We got to figure out what shapes could go where to get stuff into the um, correct spot uh, with 
you, uh, we did the zines and we got to pick from a whole bunch of questions that you put on the board. It wasn't one question put in front of us and you were like, write about this. You have to write about this topic. We had an opportunity to choose what we wanted to write about and what was important to us and what we thought about it. Um, in your class for science, we did experiments where we had to go out and pick what we wanted to put on a little uh, slide and we got to look at them under the microscopes and take pictures of it and stuff and that was all stuff we got to choose to do with the help of them putting the stuff in front of us it wasn't like here you have to do this assignment it was like here's this great assignment that we're about to be able to do it go off and do what you want to do with it learn you know it wasn't like you're going to learn about this this way so what I'm hearing is yeah. you really appreciate the choice and yeah. having a lot of like having say in what you're learning. Like being able to like mm -hmm. learn interactively and just like yeah. be in the assignment. Yeah. To help Any, anybody else in my room want to? Yeah, I would like to add on to this. Um, Favorite projects? Um, when we first started, uh, when I first started going to the school, the school was um pretty barren, but a big project came out of, you know, a little bit of the empty classrooms. We were able to build a theater and do plays. And just seeing the empty room turn into, you know, fill with people as we did our first play was such an amazing thing for me to go through. Anybody else? Favorite projects? Um, there? I'd say I don't have like a specific favorite project. Um, I just want to say it doesn't have to be structured a certain way as long as the students think that it's, you know, somewhat their idea to choose to learn then um, I think they'll be happy as long as they walk out of the project thinking that they know something that they didn't beforehand. I love that. Yeah, I don't really have a specific like, project. I just like the way how teachers just come to me and be like, you could do it how you want to do your project. You could pick either this or that. Like, yeah, right. And then we learn to have and choice. Have having having choice. choice. Amanda? Thoughts on what makes a good project? What you've liked doing with projects? Um, I like all of my projects, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, I choose stuff that is interesting for me as well, because I find that if it's something that I know I just have to cover and I have to do, that shows. So <laughs> I find things that in my head, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be great. And most of the time, that's the case. There's definitely sometimes I hear grumbling, why do we have to do this one? This is so boring. Why did you choose this? So then I turn it back on the students. I'm like, well, how would you make it better? What do you want to do instead? And then it turns into something completely different than what I had originally thought. So flexibility is the key in all of this project-based learning. All right, that's my room. So <laughs> Andrew Chandler. Mason, I'm going to give you a, um, a couple of nuggets from me. And if there are other administrators on here, they may not appreciate this very much. When you're building projects, there's two ways you can build them. One, you can take your standards and the rules of the state to, that says you have to do all of these things and you can look at those and you can build something around those. That's one philosophy that a lot of people have, especially in controlled settings. Option number two is you find out what you and your students are passionate about you build a project, and then in the end, you look back and you go, oh, we, we nailed a lot of standards inside of that one. Um, at this school, that's my approach. Go do BA work with kids that they love doing, that they smile, they laugh, they giggle, and they engage in. And then in the end, we'll figure out the, the standard stuff. Most schools don't like that. Most administrators don't like that because they can't measure it clearly and predict where it's going to go. So that that's my first thing I wanted to give to you. Um, and sometimes you got to break rules. So if the administrators are telling you you have to do it one way, shh, just do it. And in the end, you take, you, they get your hand up here like this and they go, whack. And then you go, oh, that hurt. I'll never do it again. And you go back to your room, you close the door and you do it again. Um, that's the way we do it at the ILC. I get talked to a lot by the upper people I and mean, it's okay. Um, Number two, Mason, I was going to tell you, in my four years of doing project-based learning and teaching and coaching with teachers across our county, um, 
first thing, three projects. It'll take you three projects with a group of students before you start to see the real, real magic happen. Project number one, those to create some stuff. It'll probably look terrible, but that's okay. Project two, they'll fall in love with this idea of critique and revision, and they'll start asking for more and more and more critique and revision. By project three, you'll start to see products that come through that are that are good. You want to show them off. You call in the superintendent and things like that because they're heartwarming and like good stuff. Last thing for you, authenticity and relevance. Those two things are, are the magic sauce for us anyways. Um, make it authentic, make it real, make it something they're gonna actually do something with, not just go in a folder or not just the teacher look at it, and make it relevant out in our community and, and something they can use in the future. I'm gonna zip my lips. Next. Um. I taught math, so my projects were, Lindsay mentioned the kite project. Um, so first I wanna say it's very difficult and it takes a lot of planning. And I guess just like Nick was saying, like repetition of doing these projects over and over until they become what your vision was. Um, I could say I'm a little bit of a control freak. So kind of letting go of that control and being more flexible um, was definitely necessary for me. Um, with the kites, like, I guess the main, we're like looking at polygons, like right triangles and things like that. And then I had circular kites come out of it. And so I think instead of looking at it, like, oh, you didn't do like what we were talking about, kind of change the mindset of like, this gives us a new opportunity to now look at like circles and things like that in the geometry space. So it's kind of letting the students choose and flow and working with what they're excited about. Awesome. Thank you. Any other comments from the ILC team on, on that one? And if not, I'll pass the mic to Chris. Sure. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for, for being here. It's it's so good to, to hear from all of you. It's always exciting to, to get to talk to folks at the ILC. You really are doing incredible work. Um, so I, I, I put this in the chat earlier, but I'm really curious about the fact that the ILC is opposite pedagogically of every when I think of alternative education and quote unquote like adult learning spaces, I think of doubling down on the more prison like structures that tend to occur in school. Um, if we had students, for example, that dropped out of our high school, whether when I was a kid, but also you know as a teacher, you would go to a space where you would essentially be put in front of a computer. You would be forced to learn for like eight hours at a time. The bathrooms were locked. It was really intense. So this might be kind of an obvious question, but I'm curious why you think the ILC is working despite the fact you are doing the opposite of that. You're kind of going against the grain in that regard. It's almost being, the way you described it, it's like almost being sentenced to more, man, my vocabulary is bad today. Um, sentenced to more crappy education. You're so bad at it, we're going to sentence you to weeks of more intense, crappy education. And then in time, you're eventually going to fall in love with crappy education. Maybe not. <laughs> I mean, it's really just recognizing that it didn't work. Like, there's a lot of people that and I think a lot of systems that struggle to recognize when something isn't working. Um, and I think there's a humility required to recognize that what we want to do and what we think is best might not actually be what's best. And so then it requires after that a little bit of courage to like, OK, how can we change this? What can we do differently? There have been people that have come into our building who are um, uncomfortable with some of the freedom that our students have. Why are there students walking all over the halls? Well, I don't know, ask them. What did they need in that moment? Maybe they needed a minute. Maybe they needed to use the bathroom. Maybe they needed a snack, right? Like what, they are meeting some need in there. And, and I don't think that allowing them to meet their needs is a problem. Um, and there's also an element of like culturally responsive like teaching in this, in that if part of what students 
are used to and feel comfortable with is like more cursing than you hear in the average school. Maybe that's not that big of a deal, right? Maybe teaching them to code switch in different spaces is the better idea than just saying, nope, detention, you, you, you used an F-bomb, detention, right? Like that doesn't, that didn't work. So why would we replicate that here? Anybody else? Yeah. I can say yeah, that I've, I've, I've personally been to two other, actually alternatives. So I've been to Fruitport and I've been to Oak Ridge. And like he just described, you know, you're in a classroom, put in front of a computer, making up credits on an online course and not teaching you. Or when they are teaching you, it's slapping a packet in front of you, telling you do this. And then they talk about something that's, in a book that's like this thick and you're like what in the world I don't know anything that you just told me and you just want me to do this packet and like you said bathroom breaks locked up we only had like two bathroom breaks that we could take and then that was it well here it's like completely different like the entire time we were in the classroom there and we had to be working, we even ate lunch in the classroom. Like there wasn't a lunchroom in our school and the lunchroom in the Oak Ridge one, we had to get the lunch and come back to our classroom. It was like we were trapped, like a prison, like he said. Here, we're able to be out. We have a cafeteria, we have tables. We have a gym room, like there's a basketball hoop in there. That wasn't at my other one, it was outside and we had to wait for a 30 minute break. And that was the only break we got then. So here it's like we're learning and we're able to have some type of freedom here also. And that I feel makes me learn better because I feel like I'm not trapped and have to do it. It's not a requirement. It's like you're, you can do this. You're, you're able to do this. You know, you can do it. And I feel like when somebody puts it like that to me, it's like, yeah, you know what? I can do this. I want to do it because I can do it. You know, it's not like, oh, I don't want to be here. I want to be out in the hall because you just slapped a packet in front of me. And I want to really here point. all day. That's a good point. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. And it's a funny thing, right? When we think about prisons, we think of them as healing places where people go and then they come out as, you know, changed and they, no, right? Why would mirroring the condition, prison-like conditions make people any better? We know it doesn't work even in those incarceration spaces. Um, I put myself in the hand-raising queue because I um, had a question for students to follow up with um, what the student who was speaking was just referring to. So um, for ILC students, how do you all think believe, act differently at school now and in the world, right? Outside of school, you know, when you, when you go home, when you, I mean, fingers crossed, right? Eventually one day step out of the ILC and, um, and into the world outside of it there too. How, how do you think differently as a result of your experience compared to that of the other systems and schools you've been a part of? Yeah, sir. I could, I was the one that was just talking. I could tell you right now, my experience at other schools, I did not want to go. Never. That was the main thing. Uh, I did not want to go because of being trapped in a room, monotonous assignments, stuff like that. Here, I get up in the morning and I'm like, I have school. I want, I'm going to go to school. You know, I drive myself to school. I was riding a bus down the road from my house to those other schools and I didn't want to go. Here, I drive myself here. And I'm here the entire school day, and I love being here. So I'd say that it's changed me because I actually want to learn, and I want to be here. It's a great environment to be in. Anytime that you need help, all the teachers are more than willing to help you. Nick's a great principal. I've never had a principal like him ever before. So anybody in here is more than willing to help you and do whatever it takes to get you to succeed and be where you need to be and that's why I like being here like that's the biggest change how it's changed me like I want to have an education well um I'll go next um I never did really bad in a I guess normal public school but you know some things happened in my life and I uh kind of you know just didn't I didn't like talking in school I didn't like you know I had a small group of friends at this school Everybody's so much nicer and understanding. And 
they feel like real genuine people and uh I love coming to school like I don't think every day I miss at the school I'm like dang it I wish I went to school that day <laughs> and uh, I don't think I never would have thought like that before never would have thought You know you guys okay yeah, yeah exactly. right, um i'd say at any public normal schools i wake up and go to school and then come home and go back to my room but now it's like i want to wake up and i want to come here and when i get home i want to get ready for the next day of school and i want to go show off everything that i made in school that day um it's just like a second home kind of you know everyone here and if there is a stranger then you know it's going to be someone that's valuable someone that you can talk to and someone that you can relate to i can also speak to this with faith um i had her as a freshman in the traditional high school in our district and the difference between her then and the difference between like the difference between her then and her now um the way that she conducts herself the way that she I see her motivated to do things. She had some motivation then too. She did well in my class, but the drive that she has to be here is far higher than than when I had her before. Kaylin, how are you different? Um, I would say like in public school, because my public school I went to, it was really, really strict. It was it was really, really strict. It wasn't much going on a lot they just slap papers on our face always getting kicked out the classroom for little things and I was really shy I wasn't talking and stuff because of trauma that happened in my own household so I was like dealing with a lot in school and at home so it was like coming home going to school coming home sleeping my whole day away because I just it was nothing until I came here um I was still shy kind of but I made friends I opened up more it taught me how to communicate better being here and it pushed me a lot that's incredible and I'll I just thank you for speaking to that you know you you talk about being shy and then here you are, you know, virtually to this group of educators from around uh, from around the country and, and from internationally as well. So what a testament to, you know, your own personal growth. Um, I'll, uh, I'll throw it over to Catherine here. Yeah. So this is actually Natasha. Um, gotcha, Natasha. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is more towards the students, but it would probably be interesting to hear from the teachers as well. But if you could change one thing about a traditional school, what would you change first? Marcus just got really excited to answer this question. I would like to change the schedule. The, the waking up at 6.30 in the morning to get ready to learn at 7.30 was so bad oh my <laughs> god getting to sleep in and come to school at nine o'clock is so much like and nine like we have a nine to four schedule here and it's i love it so much <laughs> being expected to learn before you wake up <laughs> yes yeah. yeah from our yeah from our video being expected to learn before you wake up somebody else what would you change about a traditional school um, I guess I got that. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. The I teachers know. that get hired at public school, I feel like I don't know. It's just teachers that are in public school are way different than people that are work at alternative schools. They understand here, they wait for you, they trust in you, they believe in you. In public schools, they don't at all. And you can really see them. Yeah, I'd say the relationship between teachers and staff, because when in public school, I felt like it was more, we get it, you have problems, but there's nothing we can do about that. What you can do is this assignment, and here it's, okay, you have problems at home, we're going to 
see what we can do about that. And then once you have time to get this assignment in, we will worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they do not care how you're feeling. There's like, you have this assignment and it's due this day. So have it done. So you better figure it out, right? Yes. Rain or shine, don't matter. <laughs> Anything else, Bess? The I mean, bathroom like, thing. The bathroom yeah, thing. Like, yeah, two <laughs> minutes to use the bathroom. What if yeah. I have to go really, really bad? Two minutes? <laughs> yeah, I feel like we should just be able to like get up and like go if we gotta go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, like, like the assignments, you know, yeah. like project based learning. Change it, you know, like do some projects, get mm -hmm. out, do something, get yeah. interactive. Don't slap some paper or a textbook in front of a student and say, read through this chapter on this page and expect them to get everything on that page. Mm -hmm. That hit everybody, so. Awesome. I was going to say the longer we let that go, the more kinds of things simmered to the surface. So that was awesome. I'll, I'll reiterate just real quick. That bathroom thing is a sticking point with just about every group of kids that uh, the HRP has ever talked with, um, unless the school has a more humane bathroom policy. So that's pretty low hanging fruit, I think, for change is to address those. And I'll, I'll just jump in real quick to ask Brian's question from the chat. And then Cassie, maybe we can, we can get to yours. Uh, but, but coming back to the, the question of PBL, um, and I think that we could tackle this both from the teacher and the student perspective. Um, but what projects have been less successful than hoped for? And what did you learn from those failures or the lack of success? Uh, I can maybe speak to this. Uh, I don't have a specific project in mind because I have tried. Again, this is like year three total for me as an educator. And I'm still trying to get a hang of this whole idea. And it's just, for me, it's been, okay, going back and seeing, okay, what about that project, either on my end or how it was ex executed, did not work? And how can we refine it for better? What processes can we look at to make it look better, sound better, flow better? It, it's just like with any PBL, it's just constant reiteration, critique, and reformation, for me, at least. DeMarcus has one that he uh, remembers not coming to fruition. Do it. One of our uh, projects for in the first year for journalism, we wanted to make a, um, we wanted to make a newspaper and we all, um, uh, and it was like about uh, haunted places in Michigan. And we got it mostly all done. But by the time we got it done, it was after Halloween. And it just, we edited it all together. And it sat in Canada for about a year. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of lost some steam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is one of the big things that I struggle with with projects is when they go on too long. Um, and sometimes it's necessary to like spend a lot of time on them to get a good product. But we lose we lose the motivation. We lose the excitement. Um, that's the neurodivergence, right? We, some of us thrive on novelty. And so sticking with something to follow through can be really hard. Um, and like, when I get bored with something, my students can tell, right? Like they can tell. Um, I, ha I have something to say, like in Mr. Loss's class, oh, like Mr. Loss said, well, Mr. Loss, don't, don't do that. I'm not going to say nothing too bad. Okay. <laughs> is it was we did this martial arts thing okay and it was gonna be like a like this martial arts against this martial arts thing and it wasn't that it like didn't work at all and or anything like that it was that we really got into the topic like we kept on talking and talking and talking more and more about the topic and we just get so wrapped into the topics that we just sit there and learn more knowledge about it and then we have to learn through the videos that are put on the screen and stuff. And the videos are interesting and stuff. They're like um, like in the war videos and stuff like that, our little um, educational videos from this guy on YouTube. And we learn from them. And then after that, we talk about them and we get so into talking that it's like, now it's the end of the hour. 
<laughs> so it was it was more or less us for Mr. Loss. I feel like that the assignment didn't go through because we didn't get to do all the assignment papers that we had to do for the assignment because we got so into all the information about the project. I have one too. So I teach anatomy and I did this anatomy of yoga class with one of our other teachers who is a certified yoga instructor. And initially it was a great concept. Uh, some of the students loved it. Some of the students were really embarrassed about trying to get into yoga poses and they thought it was really weird. Uh, things were going well and then not so well. The yoga teacher just stopped wanting to be the yoga teacher and things kind of crashed. Uh, so I think like thinking back on it, perhaps if I had more community partners, you know, someone else that I could have reached out to, to bring in as another yoga instructor to keep it going. But at the same time, I'm teaching all of the science classes and art. So I've got all these other things going on and basically have a backup plan is what I'm trying to say sometimes. Uh, so we tried it again this next uh, round of classes and it really did not work. So we just dropped it. Uh, so yeah, sometimes you just need something out there too. And that's when your community partners are really going to be helpful. Excellent. Two seconds Go ahead, on Nick. This one, Nick. Um, sorry. I, I don't get upset with teachers. We do a lot of reflection. The only time I would step in and I'm going to use the word scold a teacher is if they were not uh, first, reflecting with students a little bit, like how is this going? And second, if they try to smash something through that's not good for themselves or for the students, then we're going to have an issue. Other than that, go fail. Fall on your face. <laughs> Accept the fact that it wasn't good. Be humble with your students and say, I really sucked on that project, guys. We're going to get rid of it and we're going to move on to the next thing. Um, so, so being humble enough to do that is, is super important for me as a leader. Awesome. All right. I think Cassie, we'll go ahead and uh, head over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, this kind of goes along with what I think Amanda was saying about community partners, but your the uh, keynote video did a great job of showcasing all of those amazing community partners that you guys have worked with. Um, I think I saw, a mural in a park and pottery, and there was a talk about a brewery. So my question is around um, a little bit of a reflection on that. How does it feel to work with those outside of the classroom, outside of the school? Um, what impact did you see? Um, or maybe just some lessons learned from being in the community with those partners. I think Amanda is incredible at working with community partners. So I'm going to let her talk about that. Uh, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. So <laughs> I'm originally from the east side of the state. So when I moved over here, I don't have those connections with any of those community partners. And somehow they just kind of all came together. And I don't, I can't honestly say how that happened. Uh, with the mural project, uh, someone actually contacted me specifically about that. So like someone from Muskegon Township was like, hey, we've got this building, we're looking to get it painted. So that just kind of fell into my lap, which was awesome. Uh, the brewery one, I like breweries, and we were talking <laughs> about fermentation. So it's like, let's go check out a brewery. And that, you know, it's, you just have to think of something that you can make a connection to and just reach out and do it. Uh, there was another one. Oh, the pottery project. Uh, I like pottery as well. And I've, like on different forums and things like that on Facebook, I had seen stuff where they do um, empty bowls and they they support uh, like other, like just charities and things like that. So I was like, let's teach them how to make some bowls. And then I ended up having the students come and research various shelters, like homeless shelters in our area. Most of them had no idea that even these shelters were around. Some of them knew of them already. And then they had to pick their top three. They had to give their reasons which one they felt would be most beneficial and deserving of our money. And then once we kind of got that information together, I took it to some of the ladies in the front office who like lived in this area for a long time. And I told them between these two different places and they gave me some of their input and we went with every woman's place. And do you want to talk about that one, Demarcus? Like, how did that make you feel making all those bowls and knowing it supported that place? 
it was it definitely kept me i don't really like pottery <laughs> but thinking about you know doing it for a good cause definitely kept me chugging through it making all my bowls i had to make seven yeah, bowls which i which I, I still have to make bowls yes but i can't um, as a student i have another one as a student i can't really talk about connecting with community like community but working with them like working with the career tech center with uh and cooking stuff we made um uh We've done a whole bunch of things with uh, cooking at the CTC. We made a talk. We made tacos for the entire school once. We made cookies to hand out for Christmas and uh, stuff like that. It was really cool. Type other options in the area. No, no, that was last year. We did that last year. Last year. So community partners are a thing that's harder for me. Um, I my experience has been. Uh, some efforts to get connected to people that have just kind of like fallen through. Um, and so I'm always like continually impressed by Amanda's ability to like find these people or how they find her maybe. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but also Nick knows everybody. Literally. Yes, everybody. Does. So you could be like, Hey Nick, I'm thinking of doing this. Can you help me? Like when I need like organs so like to dissect stuff. I'm like, hey, Nick, do you know anybody where I can get such and such? And he's like, hold on. And then he- put, I got a guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he like puts a thing out on Facebook. I've got this amazing science teacher who needs various organs and this and this and that. And all of a sudden people start responding and now there's a freezer full of deer guts that we get to go through. And, you know, he just knows everybody. And if he doesn't know the people, Brandy, who is one step ahead of him, knows everybody more than he does. So- yeah, we have a lot of, sorry, I'm reading the comments. <laughs> yeah, yep, Nick definitely has an Oregon guy. Um, so yeah, it's just who you know. And since I don't know anybody, I happen to know people who know people. And that's how things just kind of fall into place for me. To put my own like little add in addition to this, sometimes it just takes good old fashioned research and just going out and finding are there people involved with the type of things that you want to do for your project that are related to it? Uh, for example, that martial arts project, I literally found a museum that does historical swordsmanship and martial arts that I was trying to get. And unfortunately, like Teresa, it didn't go through because communication broke down, but I'm hoping to get them this year. But yeah, sometimes it's just literally grabbing the bull by the horn, so to speak, and just finding who you need to need to find. Awesome. Pass it over to Josh. Thanks, Nick. Um, uh, Nick Kunin, this is for you um, and for everybody in your community. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes left and um, I have to tell you that the last like two minutes of the video that I watched last night with you and your administrator sitting on the bench is like the sweetest, most awesome piece of video I've watched, seg segment of video I've watched in a long time. The two of you having that conversation. Um, I have very mixed emotions in this moment. Um, students in Montana and in Hawaii have filed lawsuits against their state related to climate change and both won. Um, there is a teacher that I'm talking to in near Seattle who is readying a lawsuit against his school district for being obsolete, a class action lawsuit. And I wonder, Nick, this is not a question, but I just wonder, Nick, that your community could be the place where a civil rights movement begins. And that civil rights movement is what we've been talking about over the last hour. And I, I really mean that. I, I'm enough already with the alternative stuff. Every kid in America deserves what you're doing here. They really do. So anyway, just wanted to drop that on you. Hey, thank you. And um, I'll just say, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> you know, I I am willing to do whatever it takes for the people that walk through our doors. And, and Josh, whether that's um, open my doors at home, or give a ride or give a hug or whatever it may be. I, I think we're all worth it. And 
you know, as a human being, we need to make sure that we're taking care of each other and respecting each other and leads into all the stuff from yesterday morning. Um, but thank you for your words. I really appreciate that. Anybody else want to tackle that on the ILC side? If not, it's all good. I can see Teresa's finger. It's like twitching. She wants to hit the button. Okay. But she isn't doing it, but that's okay. It's all good. Uh, before we do jump off, I need to to give a big shout out. Um, Teresa talked about her a little bit earlier, but Faith, uh, Faith put together that whole video. Um, she partnered up with her ISD. There was a gentleman there that was a, uh, a videographer. We met with him. From there, we gave her an iPad Pro. And she and Demarcus did some interviews. Obviously, they brought in the whole team to interview them. But um, as a young woman, uh, I personally am so proud of her and her tenaciousness. Even with feedback, she'd take it and send me messages like, you better be paying me good for this. And <laughs> she would turn things around and, and just put her magical touch. So um, I wanted to publicly recognize face. Uh, faith for all that work that she put into to making this happen. It's pretty special. That's huge. Yeah, Faith, the video is incredible. And and Nick, you you kind of predicted my last kind of question. I wanted to give um, uh, all of you a chance, staff, students alike, just to uh, uh, share a shout out. Like, is there someone that you want to shout out uh, in this? Nick, I don't know if uh, if Faith is, is checks that box for you. If you want to shout out somebody else, I'll gladly give you that. But, but I want to hear from everybody. Just like um, shout out somebody uh, who's been important uh, in, in your life in the community of this school, because it sounds like a really incredible place. Um, I can't pick a particular one. I am looking in um, Teresa's room there. And each morning when I wake up, my battle cry, I, I look at those guys and they're the ones. They're the ones that I go to the superintendent and I'm all emotional and jacked up, but I try to control a little bit. And I demand that we deserve just as much funding as a normal K-12 student. And um, sometimes my language gets the best of me in those conversations, but thanks to those guys for, for being the thing that drives me each morning when I get up. All right, who are your shout outs? Um, no, no offense to you guys. <laughs> um, I'd say, this is Lindsay. Um, I'd say Miss Chandler, even though like she's about to be going away. Um, I have never really gotten math very well at all. Like I told her, I said, if you leave, who's gonna be teaching me math? You know, <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to learn. Um, I've had, all Fs, all through high school, all through middle school, and every single math class up until the alternative when I asked like a billion questions to one teacher and he was next to me the entire time. Ms. Chandler, I hardly ever had to ask a question because she was always asking, you understand it? Do you need any help? You know, she was probably the best math teacher I've ever had. And sorry, um, the time that she spent while I was here um, was great and she taught me a lot about math um, and I passed the class so yes <laughs> so definitely Miss Chandler. I would like to shout out all the teachers um, Miss Tay, uh, Miss Amanda, all, all the Mr. Loss, every teach, every math teacher I've had going here. <laughs> Thank you so much and uh, this school has really changed my life for the better. Um, I'd want to say everyone because I love all the staff here, but um, I'd have to say Nick because he used to be my principal or assistant principal at Reese Puffer, and he's definitely not the same kind of person or principal that he used to be. <laughs> definitely a lot better now. <laughs> <laughs> That was so great. So shout outs for growth. I love that. Um, I want to shout out everyone, but I really want to shout out Miss Chandler for helping me like math, like actually like exactly. math, because I literally hate math. <laughs> but she made me learn it, and I actually like it. And I passed, so. Yes. Good. Like Nick, I would like to shout out my students. Um, this is the kind of work that I wanted to do 
like the the change that I see in my students is what I wanted to see when I became a teacher. That was what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to see. That's the, like, I knew that was my like life's work. It was my goal. And so, um, you know, it was, I could see a little bit of it in, in other teaching jobs that I've had, but here it's the depth of difference is, yeah, it's, it's incredible. My shout out, uh, students, yeah, they're great here. Uh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, but my true shout out goes to Nick because I was here prior to Nick and this place was like the prison. They could come and go. So it was a little bit more open than a prison and they could use the bathroom whenever they wanted. But they nobody took it seriously and there was no real learning going on. There was no excitement. And then when Nick came and he was doing his interview and just talking the crazy Nick stuff that Nick talks about. I was like, this is never going to work. This is crazy. And now it's working and it's amazing. And it's because of him that we now have these students here that are successful. And it's because of Nick and his dream and his vision that us as teachers is, are able to do what we want to do, what we were, I guess, born to do. So thanks, Nick. I'll I'm just, just really appreciating Mal's commentary. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm laughing here, Joe. Um, I'll make mine quick. I'd like to shout out everybody. I, I'll i say it this much. I feel like I have two families. I have one that I go, get to go home and see every day when I go home from work. And then I get the opportunity to go and come. Sorry, I'm trying not to get choked up here, but I'm blessed to come see a family I get to go see every time I come into work every morning. All right, Chandler. Yes, thanks for <laughs> texting me and making me sad. But um, I don't know, I'm gonna get sad. I moved home like not at a good point in my life and I didn't know that I needed these people and uh, sorry. Now, like, leaving them again eight short months later, like, it's really hard. And selfishly, if I could pick them all up and bring them with me, I would do that so quick. But I know they'll always be here for me. And if I come back, like, they'll always be my second home and I can come to them for everything. So, I don't know. I appreciate our students, our staff, Nick, like... You all changed my life in such a short amount of time, and I appreciate it. Oh, Chandler, you're loved. Just so everybody knows, Chandler came to us in th uh, around Thanksgiving, and um, we needed a math teacher bad, really, really bad. And um, she jumped in, and uh, she made a significant difference in our community, and yeah, grateful. Uh, and such such a profound impact, you know, in just that amount of time. It's undeniable. I, I, I'll i echo what Cassie had put in the chat over here. Thank you all so much for sharing, being vulnerable um, in that moment. My intention was not to leave everybody in tears graphically next with that question. But um, I, I I just appreciate you all leaning, leaning into that and, and being vulnerable and open with us. As, as Cassie says, the love and belonging is so self-evident. I don't know what else you need <laughs> uh, to, to showcase the, the importance, the, the power, the impact of the work. And frankly, like uh, the, the impact that one person um, in Nick can have to, you know, recruit the Avengers of, of educators and just to um, do incredible, amazing, powerful, impactful work with kids. I, um, you know, as someone who's been on the ground and seen that in action and, and had a uh, DeMarcus and some of those students show, show us around and see, see what happens there. Um, yeah. I'd encourage anybody if you're, if you're ever up in Muskegon to stop by the ILC. Uh, I don't even know how I transition from that to the rest of the day, <laughs> um, except to say, uh, you know, we do have 
um, a handful of events still left, believe it or not. Um, we'll bring both of those learning journey tracks together um, from Trevor and Abir um, one final time uh, for, for a good 90 minute session. We'll visit the Olin Tangi STEM School out of Ohio, uh, who will give us their virtual tour. And then at four o'clock, you can, we'll all meet back up for a, for a closing session and, so, and some closing thoughts before then heading into the Thought Sanctuary this evening, again, led by Cass and, and Cornelius um, for another uh, hopefully really good, connecting, thoughtful time together. So my gosh, just uh, another huge shout out. Um, and thank you all for the ILC students, staff, y'all are doing great work. Thank you so much for sharing that with us uh, and take care. Have a good rest of the day. Have a good rest final, of the summer, everybody. My friend. One final thought from DeMarcus, if that's okay. Do it. Um, I would like to thank you guys for you know giving us this video. Probably should do doing this with uh, me and Faith doing this together was really fun and even showed that during the summer, you know, you can get some good work done in a small amount of time and make something impactful. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you, Demarcus. Take care, everybody.